Okay, hello everyone. Hi. Hi, I'm Misa Jeffries. I'm assistant curator here at CAM. Thank you for joining us for this special work in progress event with William Downs. And William, thank you so much for sharing with us today and for letting us see your yes. installation before it's finished. Um, we're planning to speak for about 20 to 25 minutes and then we're gonna open it up to questions from you all. And I thought I'd just start with a little bit of bio on you first. Great. Okay. So William Downs works in a range of mediums, but focuses primarily on drawing. He lives and works in Atlanta and has shown in solo and group shows across the country at venues such as the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, Zuckerman Museum of Art in Kennesaw, Georgia, and the Edgewood Gallery at Yale University. For Cam's 60 foot long project wall, William presents a complex drawing called Sometimes It Hurts, which belongs to a multi-part series of large scale drawings that address the body with the figure as the central aspect of the composition. In this site-specific ink wash drawing, William explores the relationship of the body to its environment. Stories, dreams, personal experiences, and observations of human behavior enter into this work. There is a psychological unease to the piece from which William awakens repressed feelings of anxiety, fear, and joy. The work on view is one of his most ambitious drawings to date. So I think, William, let's start at the beginning. Let's okay. talk about how you felt about this commission and what your initial thoughts were for the project wall. Um, I felt, the first feeling I felt was awesome. <laughs> this is gonna be a chance to do something monumental. And I think for so long, I've been staring at a sheet of paper like this, or like this, or sometimes eight feet, but having 60 feet to explore and investigate and create things that can't be you know, this big, they have to be that big. So I felt like this was a moment for me to just let go and let the narrative um, do its thing and just follow it. So I was very excited. And I knew that 60 feet was huge, but that's how my brain works. I have so many ideas that I needed, um, or I would love to put them on a huge space like that. Can you walk us through the steps of how you created this piece? Um, a lot went into it, a lot of thinking, mm -hmm. planning, um, maybe talk about your use of transparency sheets and mm -hmm. maybe even how these other drawings kind of work their way into the larger piece. Yes. For the last three, four weeks, I've been obsessed with Cezanne, Chagall, Hieronymus Bosch, Picasso's Pink Period, um, and some of the Blue Period. But I've been looking at a lot of um, circus, um, a lot of yoga images, and I wanted to create um, kind of a parade of bodies in a landscape that um, you don't know what they're doing, but they're doing something physical. So looking at a lot of um, old painters who use a lot of figures in the landscape, such as um, Chagall and Renoir and those classical guys. And Nicole Eisman is someone else that I've been studying a lot of because um, she has a lot of figures that are piled up and stacked on each other. Mm -hmm. So I've been eating a lot of that information so that when I came here, I would make that magic happen. But I teach life drawing at Georgia State University, so the body is something that I explore every single day, teaching students how to put a body together. So for me, I like to take the body apart and create these um, um, yoga extreme um, positions so that the body could kind of extend itself and go somewhere else. But um, a lot of these images come from a stack of drawings that I keep with me. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. that looks great. Um, but whenever I travel and do exhibitions, I'll bring a stack of drawings from, I work every day, so I have um, tons of references that I make, so. <laughs> So I'll come and I'll lay them down on the floor like this and try to figure out a narrative based on these gestural images that I keep with me. And then something will form based on either theory that I've been reading mm -hmm. or 
Instagram images that I've been staring at. Through Instagram, I've met a lot of yogis, mm -hmm. and they're obsessed with my handstanding. <laughs> so <laughs> I have a new audience really of good. people who follow my work who love that yoga is kind of a small um, extension of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love that endurance of how they're keeping track of me as I'm keeping track of them. And I do headstands in random spots. And when I'm working, I'll do a headstand just to kind of feel that tension. And then I'll draw it. So that's me right there in the mm. center mm -hmm. um, doing a headstand. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how everything's crafted based on little drawings that sometimes don't mean anything. But when I have a big composition, I'll try to make meaning through that. or I'll hang them all up as a quilt so that mm -hmm. the drawing will become this narrative based on the little stories that I'm trying to tell. Mm -hmm. Is there a story behind this piece? I know it's part of a larger series called it Sometimes is. It Hurts. Maybe you can talk about what that series is. The series is about um, loss and discovery. Mm -hmm. Using the body as a, a vehicle to explore this tension between um, endurance, balance. Um, there's no real gender or race, so it's like this gesture of the body, so it's kind of fleeting through. And you, when you see ghosts, I guess you see them out of the corner of your eye. So I feel like these are images that you see out of the corner of your eye. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of movement, but then there's some staticness that happens. So I'm really interested in the play of the different spaces um, physically and psychologically. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these guys are doing things and some are not. Um, some are from personal gatherings, such as the crew of people sitting in the middle. That's from um, this dream that I had of a moment where I was in Cuesta, New Mexico, for uh, a residency. Every night we would gather around the fire and the chief would talk about spirituality. And so I, I became really obsessed with that and I thought I would bring him into this composition. Mm -hmm. So there's a little glimpse of different moments of um, things happening. The framework, they're just something that's happening more and more now where I'm making a drawing and then putting frameworks on mm -hmm. the whole thing. And I feel like that's kind of a window of a moment that happened amongst this whole circus of things that are happening. Um, mm -hmm. Some have titles and some don't, but mm -hmm. in this Sometimes It Hurts, it's connected through the thorns that are happening. Uh-huh. Okay, there's a lot to pull out from that. Um, <laughs> so the, the framed pieces here, well, they're their own works of art. So when this wall, you know, when the exhibition is finished, we're going to paint over this wall, right. unfortunately. Yeah. But these pieces will exist within other works. Yes. Maybe you tend to kind of recycle images and drawings. I do. Okay. I do. I mm -hmm. feel like I'm obsessed with keeping that recycling going so that something's going to happen with it. Mm -hmm. And I like to have discoveries and find out what's going to happen next mm -hmm. in the work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I plan, but I don't plan. Like, there's a plan but I like the discovery of finding things out. So how much did you plan with this wall? Like what elements did you know were going to happen and then what did you improvise when you got here? I knew that it was gonna be a parade of people okay. doing yoga positions. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that was gonna be the central image uh -huh. because I want the, the viewer to fall in love with that and then look at it this way. Mm -hmm. um, so that was planned and the lyrics from George Clinton has been in a lot of my drawings lately mm -hmm. because it's a reference that kind of talks about culture and things that are still happening that was happening then. Mm -hmm. And I feel like he is this guy who was ambiguous during that time and I, I like how he was collecting musicians from different genres of music and putting them together and not giving them a plan sometimes. Mm -hmm. And somehow the music would just do its thing. So I feel like a lot of my lines are like that. Mm -hmm. Just going through the composition where they don't mean certain things, but they carry you through. And I feel like that's mm -hmm. um, the heart of this work. Yeah. 
Yeah, I feel like there's kind of like a musicality to the piece. There's rhythm and balance. Mm -hmm. I was actually doing some reading about you and your upbringing and learned that your grandmother was a gospel singer yes. and that choir music was really important to your upbringing. Yes. So can you talk a little bit more about how music features into your work? We listen to it when we work and yeah. we try to find that sound with line texture. Mm -hmm. um, Ink wash has been something that I've been exploring for 20 years because I teach it to my students. So mm -hmm. I like to practice what I teach. So with that, I'm trying to get a value scale that matches sound. Okay. And then you can put color on top of that if you're a painter mm -hmm. and you paint with lots of color, uh -huh. you know how value works with that scheme. Uh -huh. So with that, I'm matching that with the sounds that we're listening to. And growing up, that's how I kind of started drawing was listening to um, the music and trying to channel that through to the drawing or painting that I was working on. Mm -hmm. So it's always been in my system for a long time. Okay, so it's sort of already embodied within you, but then you also literally are being inspired by the music that you're listening yes. to while you're installing. Mm -hmm. What kind of music yes. do you listen to? Um, we try to keep a, uh, a long list of things that kind of goes with the different textures or the narrative. So mm -hmm. we start with a slow build up to um, heavy stuff. So Funkadelic is mm -hmm. on the main list. Yeah. And Will Oldham is a, he's a good friend, but his music sometimes helps the narrative in my work come out. So he's always on the track. Mm -hmm. Bill Callahan also. So they're like singer songwriters. Um, who I'm really obsessed with. Then there's some country, because mm -hmm. I'm from the country. Mm -hmm. And um, George Jones is a good one, and Merle Haggard is someone else that we listen to. Okay. So a lot of the, their narrative kind of help lead me into how certain figures are interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to go back to the reason why you work with ink wash also. Um, I was reading that you had said at one point that it has its own free mind. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you can explain what that means and why you've chosen to work with ink wash and maybe how that translates with this sort of musicality. Yes. And sorry, I have a million questions related no, to that. Okay, good. start with that, okay. then I've got a couple more. <laughs> yeah. So ink wash is a very primitive medium, started by the Japanese mm -hmm. um, painters. It's a very delicate medium where you could lose everything by adding too much ink. Mm -hmm. It'll go black. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've learned how to slowly have patience. And that patience um, helps the gradation of going from light to dark and not losing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you're working on paper, you have to saturate it for each color that you're putting down. So it does give you that moment of like zenness or that patience because you don't want to overwork it. Yeah. On drywall, it's a little bit different. It's not as forgiving. So I like the challenge of like making sure that my line is going to do its thing because the brush um, has its own kind of um, sensation. And when you use these brushes, mm -hmm. bamboo brushes so there's a huge point and it holds a lot of water yeah and with that we can make a line that's four feet long so I like the challenge of like dragging it across the page and knowing that the ink is going to still be in there mm -hmm. by the time I reach across mm -hmm. so physically I love the challenge with having this kind of um, tool uh -huh. So the lines are always going to be different, and mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. There's a lot of variables, too, and I'm just thinking about the fact that you often collaborate with other artists, or you've got Robert Henry here, yes. your assistant yes. and fellow artist, who's um, entrusted to help you execute yes. this piece. And so there is that element of trust there, because you're exactly. not controlling all of the marks that he's making as well. Right. Yeah. And I trust that when I say Robert, I want that ladder to go this way and make the rungs go this way but leave that drip yeah and he knows exactly how to do it yeah so, but I should start by saying that Robert was one of my first students at Georgia State when I first started teaching there five years ago okay. so we have that relationship of he understands 
how I work mm -hmm. and my delivery of things. So that sensibility is a very trusted, sacred thing. Yeah. So it's like the, the trust that I give him, I know it's going to go well. Mm -hmm. There's no yeah. worry. Yeah. Um, going back to the ink wash, mm -hmm. why do you tend to primarily work in black and white? I know that in the past you haven't always, but right. more recently it's been pretty much monochromatic. There was a, there was a mood shift. Like I left New York, went to New Orleans, and then I moved back to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And during that traveling and that movement, I shifted things around in my studio. I went from vivid colors to just paring down to go to black and white. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was a way of me figuring out how to make something from a minimal medium with a big impact. Yeah. So you're forced to kind of think about color when you're mm -hmm. using black and white, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you can reverse that and understand that color and black and white kind of line up together in the color spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I wanted something with a lot of weight to it mm -hmm. because I think there's like a challenge in moving back to the South, having to deal with that movement kind of went along with the choice of going black and white. Mm -hmm. We dream in black, black and white, white as yes, well. Yes, exactly. That's another thing. I'm mm -hmm. glad you brought that up. A lot of my work is um, fueled by certain dreams that I have. Mm -hmm. And I try my best to sleep maybe four to five hours so that I can kind of go in that dream state, but then wake up and remember it. So it's kind of something that I do at night so that when I wake up, the first thing that I do is think about what I have to do in the day. And then when I go into the studio, those dreams are kind of sitting there in little file cabinets in my brain. Mm -hmm. I just pull them out and make drawings from them. And then I'll go to school and some of those drawings I'll bring with me to show my students and get them to kind of loosen up a little bit because some of them have this tension and fear of drawing. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, look, we can have fun with this. So yeah. just loosen up a little bit. <laughs> and it works every time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your dreams feature into your work, yes. yoga, yes. art historical references, music, mm -hmm. anything else? <laughs> um, traveling, okay. um, yeah. like whenever I fly somewhere, mm -hmm. I'm completely obsessed with watching how people gather and how they deal with their items and how people kind of have a, a traditional thing or they have a process. And I'm really interested in how we do that in groups or, or like at cafes or when people are gathering together, there's this thing that I observe. Mm -hmm. Very good observer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see a lot of groupings yes. um, within this piece. Maybe we should talk a little bit more about some of these poses or maybe even the central figure if you mm -hmm. want to Talk a little bit about that. I noticed so strongly those earlobes, you know, and yes. I wanted to know a little bit more about that. Um, so I, I'm trying my best to get closer to um, the yoga, yogi practice and learn how the yogis are very extreme with their practice. And there's a place that I can't remember the name where in India they go and they, it's like, you just do yoga all day, and nothing else. Um, I'm obsessed with how they can not eat food for a long time, mm -hmm. but the practice and the, the rigor of yoga is very important. The thorns came about um, when I read an article about these yogis that would lay in beds of thorns until they felt this utopia or the extension of what their practice is. So if it did not prick their body, they were extreme, or they're um, moving up the ladder in the whole yoga practice. Mm -hmm. So that's where that came from. So he's kind of the guy that's kind of roping everybody together, mm -hmm. and the streamers are the, the magic that's coming out of his hands. Okay, yeah. I feel like there's also this sense of sort of vulnerability of the body also, especially with all those thorns that yes. are connecting everybody. These figures are completely wrapped in thorns, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also just, you said yourself, being inverted or being in these yoga poses, it's a very kind of vulnerable positioning. Right. Maybe talk about the kind of hands up as well and maybe how that relates to. Oh, yeah. So the hands up, which is definitely um, connected to being under arrest or mm -hmm. being um, connected to a position where your body is like opening up. Yeah. 
and that's a yoga practice, and it's something that happens when you're under arrest. Mm -hmm. So I'm just supposing those two things together to show how you feel when you're in both positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One's relaxed and one's intense. Yeah. So it's kind of like that juxtaposition of emotional um, trauma. Yeah. Yeah. And not trauma. <laughs> so there's a lot of dualities going on with that. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that people are going to interact with this piece, or how do you hope that they might? I hope that it becomes a, um, a narrative that people can plug their own thoughts into. Mm -hmm. Or I want them to feel the sense of intensity or uncomfort, but at the same time comfort because the figures are all very relaxed and yeah. they're tied up with these things that are supposed to hurt you, mm -hmm. thorns or um, barbed wire. So I, I want to give people a nice um, exploration of their feelings, mm -hmm. yeah. whether it's good or bad or happy or sad. Mm -hmm. But I think um, you'll find something in there. Yeah, I think so. And I like that um, I'm giving people who love drawing, I'm trying to give them all of the things in drawing that we do, like in foundation, mm -hmm. which is um, balance, negative space, positive space, rhythm, design. So I'm bringing all the elements of drawing with yeah. this. Have you done the Basquiat figure yet? Yes. So the guy in the distance is um, my Ode to Basquiat. Um, He's been in a couple draw wall drawings I've made already, so he's tagged along and he's following me through um, these journeys. <laughs> Which is great, because so we have a Basquiat yeah, show. Yeah, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have questions from anyone else in the audience? I can keep going, but I'd like to open it up as well. Yes. This is one nation under a groove. There's this group of people that are finding a groove in something. And whether they're, they're part of something or not, but they're in this kind of circus or parade of people who are reveling in these beds of thorns. Is this the first time that you've put lyrics into? No, no there's going to be more lyrics in the top corner. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I like to plug from certain songs that are very um, visual yeah. in, the term, in the way that they use words. Mm -hmm. So that's why I use that one, because people who are obsessed or fans of Parliament and Funkadelic, mm -hmm. they'll be excited that that's there. Um, I have it in my studio, and I had a studio visit with a bunch of people, and this woman came up to me, and she was like, that lyric makes me want to move. I don't know who it is. And I was like, oh yeah, that's Parliament Funkadelic. And I played the song for her and she was like, oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> that's great. So it's amazing how words can make you feel a certain way. And the way that we wrote it, I want it to feel like it's like in a bathroom wall somewhere or graffiti on the side of a building somewhere. <laughs> so it's kind of like rough. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Right here? I was curious about the, uh, the figures whose arms, hands are extended. So three people or two people and a dream whose head is among the eyes. Okay, the question is, yeah, what about him? Who is yeah. he? With the third person, whose head is among the eyes. Yes, um, so the way that I projected that one, I wanted it to be a connection between the two at the top. And the two at the top are, um, the two at the top are connected to my mom and my dad. And that's me connecting to them because my father passed away a year ago. So me and my mom are like teaming up to figure out how to continue and to do things that my dad used to do. Now I'm taking the role. So that central figure is kind of like me growing up and being my father. And then the hands are supporting us from a distance, which are my dad's hands. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. So this one um, is two people in the woods standing up. They're covered with leaves, um, so I use a stencil to kind of trace that out. So it's this memory of loss, um, but it's still there. Um, I was going to incorporate it here, but it made more sense to keep the frame pieces with the element. Um, so these all were made within the same time period, these three. So I'm working from them. So they're kind of like the guides that create everything else. And the frame I chose because of my skin color. So I'm kind of obsessed with red maple. So that's another extension to the work that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I used to use like a blonde finish, which I felt like the drawing would disappear. And now I want my drawings to be more contained and solid. So I've invested in making sure that every drawing I make now will have that frame on it. Yes. But it's also a lot of presences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's also the watching eye. I mean, there are yes. lots of different things that it can mean. Can you just talk a little bit about why you use that and what you want us to sort of think about when right. we see all those clusters of eyes? So it's, um, there's a, a list of things that I've attached to all the eyes. Um, the first thing is seeing is something that we do first. And that's what I tell my students. It's like we see first, so then we have to understand what we look at. And then two, the eyes are connected to people who we've lost in the last four years to um, police violence. So I'm bringing them along as their spirits are still looking at us. And I've lost a lot of people in my life, um, close family members, so some of their eyes are plugged in the drawing also. But I use a lot of eyes in the way that you look at somebody. Um, I want my figures to either be engaged with you or not, or there's this blurriness of eyes. So that's another thing that I'm attaching to the work. But um, we all feel um, like someone's watching us. <laughs> And these things, I feel like, are watching us. So <laughs> everybody has an iPhone, so I think about the eyes as a reflection of that, too. But we're always being watched, so that's kind of the big thing. So I know that you speak about all the body movement relating to yoga or yogis, but it screams out to, I guess, my kids yes uh -huh. yes 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 we talked about that at dinner the other night and it's funny you say that he was somebody that I was obsessed with as a kid and um, I always thought about how that painting of everybody dancing is kind of a reflection and people are more obsessed with yoga now I feel like and it's like their new religion so <laughs> I mean people dance but I feel like people do yoga more than dance. And I'm just kind of highlighting that, but I'm kind of mixing a little bit of the dance in there too. Um, but yes, those are good paintings. Can you maybe talk a little bit about the landscape or the space that the paintings are inhabiting? Yes. So I spent, um, a, I spent five days, two summers ago in New Mexico. And driving from Atlanta to New Mexico was kind of mesmerizing for me because of how all the mountains are surrounding you the whole drive. And then when I got to Cuesta, one day I went out at five in the morning and I watched the sun rise and, or the moon set and sunrise and just seeing all around how the colors were changing and you're surrounded by mountains. So I thought I would bring that with me and um, kind of also shout out to my landscape painters. But I really love the, the desert landscape in New Mexico. And they all look like bodies. So I kind of like play on that with having little points at the top there. To kind of reference the body and mountains together. It also seems like it's us. 
place that lends itself to meditation. Yes. Or contemplative, contemplative states. Yes, exactly. Like the barrenness of the mm-hmm. monumentality of the Yes, yes. And um, also, um, they're good for hiking. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, I've always been really fascinated with the way that several of your figures look like they're moving, mm-hmm. like their heads look like they're moving. Yes. Um, and I don't know, like I know, you told me one story before, I know what, how much of that story you want to share, but I, I think it'd be interesting to unpack, like, what, what is it that you're trying to achieve with that, or how did that come to be in your practice? Um, that's a great question. So I think um, it's kind of a personal thing in the way that I'm a very extreme person and I like to do extreme sports and do extreme things. Um, I was a bicycle messenger once and one late night I got hit by a car and the car threw me in the air, hit the ground and it knocked me out. So it took me four or five minutes to wake up But as I was waking up, I felt like my body was like a thousand bodies standing up. So in not having my glasses, everything was super blurry. So I was doing like this, trying to figure out where I was, what I was going to do next. But as an artist, I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. I got to think about this. And then when I recovered from the accident, three days or four days later, I went into the studio and I started drawing how I was feeling with lots of heads and lots of emotions at that moment and then it stuck when I saw Chagall drawing with the multiple heads on one of his statues so I was like I'm onto something and then um, it just felt like this gestural moment that I was connecting to so when I teach life drawing gesture drawing to me is the most important part of warming warming up so I take that into my practice of always warming up even though it's going to be a final piece but it's like that memory of having that feeling, but trying to redraw it every time. Yes? Um, question about that black space. Yes. Um, because psychologically, it just keeps disappearing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm watching this, and that space just disappears. Yes. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's a great question, because that was something that I wanted to um, hold that drawing and make you focus on the drawing, but I, I love when certain things are like disrupted, like at the end of something, like at the end of a tape, you hear that but when you finish film, it's like that moment or the turbulence when you're flying and the brakes are pulling up on the airplane. But that moment of like screeching, that's what I'm kind of thinking about, that void is but there's gonna be more white thorns in there, so it might bring some more attention to that space. (laughs) Thank you. Yes? I was wondering if anything in your plan changed once you got to the space or to St. Louis. Yes. Um, So that guy happened here. In the beginning, I never thought about bringing a gigantic figure like that into the work until I got here and I was like "Ah, yes I can make the tallest drawing ever or the biggest figure ever so that was something that was a great surprise and I just found it here Um, let's see what else there was going to be more tassel but I like that we just chose to do a little bit instead of a lot like I brought a box of tassels that I was going to string her across. But I thought, let's just give a little bit of magic, not a lot. <laughs> so that was a great question. Yes? Just like, going back, and you mentioned that's kind of your last mm-hmm. figure, and, and you talked a little bit about that there is in your mind and it ends up with this idea of people lost in their minds, et cetera. Your, this looks like your work, this is your practice, it's clearly true to what you do, but mm-hmm. how much did you think about the other shows that were going to be right around you when you were actually bringing this composition to be? I mean, was it, was it a nice 
fame to have in the background, a nice influence? Was it? Uh, oh no, it's. I have not slept since um, uh, Weston told me that they were going to be in the show. <laughs> so <laughs> it's been on my mind, and I'm a fan of both um, Sanford and Basquiat. I know Sanford from living in New York for a long time, so that was great to be um, standing beside him, you know, showing beside him. So I thought that um, the, the elements that I have in my work kind of works with their elements mm -hmm. a little bit. And from freshman year of college, I think there was a Basquiat book on our coffee table near my bed in the bathroom with our magazines. So he's been the person that I've been obsessed with since I was a teenager. So it feels good that I'm kind of in the same room with them. So I'm thinking about it in that way. And a lot of my mark making, um, I studied from his paintings and drawings from freshman year of college. And I also haven't said this, but I'm an art handler. I've installed work for many people. So I've always been in museums, like getting, like to hold the Basquiat drawings or helping Sanford hang something. So I have that physical connection to both of them. Um, in Atlanta, there's a collector who has um, a few Basquiat paintings in which I hung a couple months ago, which is amazing. So I've had my hands on both of those guys for a long time. <laughs> but it, it's so exciting to have this next to them and see the relationships of some of the thoughts. Um, like Sanford's pieces, um, I had no idea that he was making those pieces. And that drawing right there is kind of a relationship to that, which um, it just so happened. It's a, a nice juxtaposition, a nice surprise. I'm going to ask one last question, I think. Yes. Um, I keep wanting to think of this piece as a painting for mm -hmm. some reason. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just wonder, you know, because you're using brushes, mm -hmm. um, what makes it, like, why is it within the genre of drawing? drawing. Ink. The ink. Mm -hmm. Just because of the ink. The ink wash has been a drawing method for a long time. Yeah. So I think um, when you um, look at the history of drawing, it's all black, mostly black and white. Mostly, I mean, there's yeah. color, mm -hmm. but um, most um, people start with a black and white and then make color from that. Or they make a pencil drawing and then make a painting. So I feel like this is the under, this is the first coat. Mm -hmm. Like we could put color on this and get rid of the black and white, mm -hmm. but this will help us see the value change and the temperature change in the work if we use color. I see, yeah. So value and temperature, works with black and white and color. Uh -huh. But I like the ink wash as a drawing tool because it gives you the freedom, it gives you the range of textures, mm -hmm. just like if you were planning out a painting. Okay. But um, it's mostly because it's ink. Okay. That it's closer to drawing than painting. Yeah. And then watercolor would be next. Yeah, it feels you know? similar to that in some ways. But that's paint. Yes. You know, so yes. that um, difference in the, the what it's made out of also yeah. separates it. Okay. Any other questions for William? Oh, Jose. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's. Oh, um, no, I carry organs. Um, so our company that I was working for also... Human, human yes, organs. Transplant yes, yes, organs. Yes, yes, yes. Livers, hearts. Um, I know. <laughs> but they're faster because you can run all the lights. Yeah. And in Atlanta, all the hospitals were three miles between each other. So the helicopter would come, drop off the organs. I would go in. They would give me this... Um, container that I would put in my bag and I had 30 minutes to get to the next hospital to yes. go into the person. Mm -hmm. So I would ride a fixed gear bicycle with no brakes and I would run every single red light from the pickup to the drop off. So, so. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I wasn't carrying anything, thankfully. <laughs> no, not that time. Um, so is that where the vest comes from then? So the vest like comes, no, the vest comes from my obsession with construction workers. Okay. We learned that today. In Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> Atlanta is <laughs> under construction. Yeah. Every corner, yeah. every street in the whole city is under construction. So everywhere I travel, I observe construction workers. And when they're not working, <laughs> I'll take a photograph of them and make a hashtag called not working. Because <laughs> they should be working. <laughs> <And> <laughs> So I take the place of an art worker. That's why I wear the vest. And when I'm traveling around, I'll have a different vest for the different jobs that I'm doing. So I, I love the idea of um, connecting art to workers. And because we're kind of like union workers. Um, so that's where the vest comes in. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a great question. Um, actually, I, I, I don't think so because um, I was telling Robert, like, when I walked into this room, it was like I was on. And every mark that I've been making, I have not had to um, backtrack. So it's been moving forward. and. Everything's been working out. There's not any major or any accidents at all. It's the first time that I've ever had this experience where all the lines worked out and there's no um, editing. So, yeah. Um, I think sometimes we have to refine things a little bit, um, but that's about it. Okay. Well, William, thank you so much for yes, sharing with us. Thank, thank you, everyone, you guys for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>